one thing that I would like to fight on the particles behavior is this tendency for them to kind of scatter a bit too much as after they hit the target, they kind of uh, collide and they bounce back and they're still kind of, even with um, using pop fluid with a considerable neighbor size count, it's still kind of going all over the place. And I want to apply some kind of force that will allow me to keep them being attracted by the target. And there's one force that's really good for that. Let's go inside the pop network. I'm going to disable the pop fluid for a moment. It's going to be much faster. And that's going to be pop force, pop attract. And pop attract pretty much does what it, what it says. It will attract the particles uh, towards one particular goal. And as you can see, we can establish one goal. This isn't great. The if we use one specific goal for all particles, uh, this is going to be kind of uh, strange. The force is controlled here. You have different ways of uh, applying it. For now, I'm just going to be using the force scale of, um, let's go with 10. So it's pretty, pretty um, explicit. And um, on the maximum distance, this is the distance after which they're no longer considered by this force. So no force will be applied to them. Considering the scale of our object, uh, 100 is probably too much, but we, we, we don't need to worry too much about this uh, either. The peak force distance is the distance at which the particles will be subject to this value at 100%. So when they're closer to target, they're, they're not affected as much. When they're a bit further away up to this distance, uh, they reach the maximum value. So there's a grading of the force being applied to them. I'm going to say that the peak force is going to be at 0.5. After that, what else? Let's try to see what this does. Right now, they're being emitted, they're going to be emitted, and they're going to be attracted by that point, point 0. Okay, and you see that they kind of go around and try to redirect themselves to find their target. Okay. Could be an interesting fact, not really for us, but yeah. So the goal is for us to establish, we need to establish some target on the surface. Um, for each one of the particles, they should have one particular target. Lucky for us, because we're already calculating collisions, and if you go here to the collision behavior, we have ha add hit attributes. And let's have a look at those hit attributes. So let's go not here, let's turn off the pop attract. Let's let them collide with our object without the pop fluid. You can see it's much faster. Uh, and once we collide with the object, if you go here to the pop object, look for geometry, and you'll see we have a bunch of attributes, and some attributes will have the prefix hit. Those are attributes uh, coming from the calculation of the collision. The ones that we're interested in is the hit prim, this one, and the hit prim UV. It should be hit UV. Sorry, hit UV. So these are the two attributes that we're interested in, hit prim and hit UV. This will give us an exact position on the surface of the object where the particle has hit and to which we may want to keep her attracted to. So let's give that a try. Here on the pop attract, we'll use the goal, use vex expressions, and the expression that we're going to be using is the following. So here on the attraction type, we'll use surface points. Use vex expressions. And you can see here that we have a saw path where we're going to be placing our prep robot as well. We have a primitive number, which is if you leave your cursor over it, you'll see it's a gold prim, and you have the gold prim UV. So these are the two ones that we're going to be setting up. So we want the gold prim to be equal to at hit prim. This alone would give us something because the UVW will be considered as uh, zero. So 
this would work already. But if you want to be more precise, you can say that the goal frame UV is going to be equal to the V at hit UV. And here let's add the I. So now each particle will have its own target on the surface of the object. Let's see how that works. What's happening here is that they're immediately being attracted to nothing, okay? Because most of the particles haven't hit the object yet, so they don't have um, these parameters, these attributes set up. So we need to figure out a way of only apply the pop attract to the group of particles that has already collided with the object. Pretty easy to do. Just go to the pop solver and set a collide group. I'm going to call it collided. You can even color it in red so you can have a look. So let's uh, disable the pop attract for a moment and you'll see that they get turned into red once they hit the object. Okay. So now we know that we have our pop group uh, working. Let's turn on pop attract, disable the color hits. And on the pop attract, let's make sure we have the group option turned on and we just want the effect to collide it. Let's see how this looks. So what's happening now is that our particles are colliding, behaving just as they used to, but most particles will now be attracted to that point on the surface. That point on the surface that they hit before is a point that they're going to be attracted to. I don't think we'll see any particle come back. We don't have enough uh, force for that, I guess. But we could go with some extreme values so we can have an idea of what's, uh, what's actually happening. So I'm going to go with 100. And you should see the difference. Notice how much more contained the blast is now. If we reduce the peak distance force, that will do even more. So let's go with 0 0.1. So now every particle that's beyond 0 0.1 distance to the, um, the target will have a force, will suffer a force, an attraction force of 100. So now it's much more contained again. It's a completely different shape than what we had before. Notice how they keep contracted here at frame 1032. Let me turn off collided, uh, the pop attract. And let's go to frame 32. And notice how much more scattered they are already at frame 32. Okay. You can do some wedging to figure out which force you like the best. I'm going to go with 40, um, turn on pop attract and turn on pop fluid. And this will give us a very peculiar type of, um, or a different uh, type of simulation. Like this should give us a different look on the behavior of this blast. I'm going to go up and I'm going to do some caching. I'm not going to do wedging, though you can. Um, give that a try, do some wedging with different values on the force. But for now, I'm just going to cache this single uh, version uh, up to frame 1080, I guess. Yeah, let's give that a try. I would probably also like to increase the resolution. So let's go to the scatter node. And on the scatter node, I'll go up to 1 million six. And having done that, I also need to compensate nay size. So here on the pop net, I'm going to go to the pop solver or the pop fluid and increase the neighbor size to 2000. This should take a while to calculate. Keep in mind that uh, the limits of your own hardware. So I have a thread reaper with uh, 32 cores and I also have a lot of RAM. My GPU isn't great. It's uh, nothing special. It's a 2080, um, but it's it's good enough. And uh, 
another very important thing that I almost forgot to mention is if you're using pop fluid, the algorithm that's being used for calculating the neighbors is using OpenCL, so it's much, it's much faster, but it does um, break v much faster as well if you don't have enough um, VRAM, okay? So I'm gonna disable it because I know that my GPU doesn't have enough memory to deal with all these particles. I'll hit save to save the file and just hit save to disk.